Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, presented by AT&T 5G. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer. Matt Doyle, feline in the re- in the lap. He is ready. Caitlin Carr, David Goss. The U.S. is like not quite banner qualified for Qatar 2022. We're not quite in the World Cup, but we got it out for a second. We're feeling pretty confident. A big win over Panama and Orlando. Where have I heard that one before? And a draw is at, at Azteca. And, of course, Canada are absolutely in. They are going to Qatar. It was a party at BMO on Sunday night. Jamaica, the victim. Canada, the victors. Here we are. Talking about the World Cup in somewhat positive fashion. How you feeling, Doyle? I know you had a tough one on the watch along last night. It was an emotional <laughs> roller coaster for you. It felt like a little bit down, 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 and then it was the climb to the top. Where are you at, man? Uh, I'm feeling pretty good. As a lifelong Canadian fan, uh, yesterday was just uh, the, one of the biggest Dream days come of true. my sporting life. Yeah, other than obviously the the women uh, winning like that. That yesterday was it. So yeah, I feel I feel great after that. Did the U.S. play? I, don't know. I didn't catch that game if they did. Doyle, what was your favorite um, Commonwealth games? What were the ones when Canada played USSR in hockey? What were those called? Man, Canada <laughs> fans are so pissed right now. <laughs> I made it worse. <laughs> you did. You tried, though. I, yeah. I really think you tried. And look, the, I, the, the, go the ahead, three of us were paid for this, but uh, Kalen was... <laughs> He would, the man was in Colombia sneaking away the from Summit weddings. Summit Series, of course. <laughs> sneaking I, away from weddings to see these games. I, I was in actually going through customs during the U.S. the first half of the U.S. game, and there was a crazy long line, and uh, every goal I was, like, celebrating. <laughs> and everybody was, like, looking around at me. I was watching my phone, and they're like, everyone is in their most miserable experience. It was like being with U.S. Men's National Team Twitter fans in real life. Just you're like <laughs> waiting. Everything is hours. terrible. Yeah. Complaining. Yeah. Complaining. Like, and then to like look up and see official? some guy like jumping up like celebrating every time there was a goal and like celebrating. <laughs> People were like what is going on over there? So yeah, it was an interesting day. You know, you know the managers and customs. They, they, they had the wrong guys for the shift. You just didn't know if they were going to get through, didn't know if they were going to handle the business in the end that they did. Uh, let's talk about all of it. Uh, let's start with sort of the basics in the octagonal right now. Poor Panama. Their last two windows did not go as planned. Of course, a 5-1 loss to the U.S. or just, just eliminated them. So 18 points. Costa Rica's four ahead. There's one game left. You can do the math on that one. So it comes down to Canada, the USA, Mexico, and Costa Rica. Canada have the check mark. Remove them. It's just a matter of what seed they have, what pot they go into. We'll talk about that later. The U.S., 25 points plus 13 goal differential. El Tri, 25 points plus 7 goal differential. Had a late goal in Honduras that got it done. And Costa Rica, four wins out of their last five, including at home against Canada, give them the first L that they've taken the octagonal, up to 22 points. Their goal differential is plus 3. That means... In all likelihood, it's almost a certainty. I'm saying almost. I'm knocking on wood here. We know how crazy things have happened in the past. One scenario killed the U.S. in the last qualification cycle. Uh, Costa Rica will probably be in that playing game against New Zealand, we assume. Dave, I know you're up on Oceana more than anybody else uh, in this North America. Solomon Islands, dream run. I know. Yeah, they're the St. Peter's of Oceana, so (laughs) everyone's really excited. But I'm excited for this one moment. For the first time since qualifying began, I can look across the squares to Matt Doyle and say we're both El Salvador fans, right? We can root for Mexico to lose now. Every window, Doyle's like, no, 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 it's actually would mathematically be better. You technically have to root. (laughs) Now, Doyle, look me in the eyes and say, go El Salvador. (laughs) Vamos. Vamos la selecta. Absolutely. Yes. Three points at the Azteca. You know that Hugo Perez is going to go for it. Absolutely. Why not? And if they have the goal differential in Costa Rica, I mean, I guess I would take Costa Rica beating the U.S., obviously. We don't love that, but would no, we, we love Mexico love to be on the very brink? Uh, perhaps. Perhaps that would be <laughs> enjoyable uh, for those of us on this show. But look, we're down to four teams, uh, but we would know one is in. And before we get into the U.S. and dig deeper on that, we will dig deeper on Canada and their win uh, at home against Jamaica to seal this thing. A party it was in the snow at BMO. Uh yeah, let's let's just let's just celebrate, man. It's, I'm I'm 35 years old. I think I was born in the middle of the World Cup that they played in 1986. If you look back on the images, or if you've read Pablo Maurer's story, or you know maybe you're a Canadian that's old enough to remember these things, it is a completely different era of the world of soccer of the Canadian national team. This new era, Dave, delivered, and we were fortunate enough to be on with the St. Ricketts and Pat Onstad during that game. 
and it was just it just to feel the energy that they had to feel not just the relief but the joy that they had to see the development of the game and the national team and the men's level of course the women have been doing this for a while now uh in canada it's like we're living a little bit vicariously like it's not ours we don't get to celebrate it as ours but it's so awesome to see them do this and do it in the style that they did and dominate the octagonal which is exactly what they've done and it's part of our family i think that's part of where you get that emotional connection right is uh, a lot of people that that believe in the same things and feel the same things in the u.s and in canada and so you sort of have that kinship and that fight um you know to get notoriety for the sport to get opportunities for people working in the sport to get situations for players to be able to succeed um, and now you're starting to see a lot of that come to fruition. I, I, I texted with Corey Ray, who's at Columbus Crew as their assistant GM, who was one of the first employees of TFC. And he's like, I walked through that stadium at BMO before it was built. And now to see all the Canada flags there waving as we qualify all this cycle later, is, it was so cool for him. Patrice was there texting with him. We were on with Toe St. Ricketts, who had to go to Scandinavia and Lithuania and Israel to find a spot to play as a Canadian because he wasn't a domestic in MLS and there weren't enough spots. And now you've got Alfonso Davies who can come through Vancouver too, into Vancouver and get sold before the age that Tosan Ricketts was even playing professional soccer. Like the landscape has changed. It's changed quickly. Um, and there's a lot of people that should be celebrating and be celebrated that finally are. Uh, Atiba Hutchinson probably being at the front of that line. And a ton of other people behind who have done work behind the scenes for the team, played with the team. Um, so it was really cool to see. And, and it's, you know, I think it's been faster than anyone thought, which is what's so shocking. I keep coming back to they were not in the hex if it had gone down the way it was supposed to go down pre-COVID. And then because of COVID shifting, became the Octo, they qualified, they got in, and now they are the best team in CONCACAF. It is so quick and so incredible and I think you're looking at a team that really represents Canada at its best. Players from all different backgrounds, all different styles, coming through all different systems is really special at a time like this. Uh, and I think a lot of people are connecting. The numbers are through the roof of people watching this team. And I've said it on this show a lot. John Herdman and this team had to win back hearts and minds from people who were like, eh, I've seen you play well at times, but I'm going to be let down. In Costa Rica last week, the home game, over a million people watched at 10 p.m. Eastern time kickoff from Costa Rica like that's that's what this team's doing Alfonso Davies the biggest athlete in the country now alone not competitive with other people he is the face uh and so it's it's really cool to see and I think uh I said this on I must say maybe a hot take I, I know they'd want to win every game but maybe not beating Costa Rica and like needing that little bit of tension that you need to win against Jamaica gave you the like Full explosion once they scored. We were on with Toe Saint on, on that first goal. He's screaming, Pat Onstead comes on. He's ready to drink. Like, it was just, I think, the perfect moment in Toronto against Jamaica, a team that normally would have been the home team in that stadium. Uh, it was pretty special. Uh, our resident Brampton expert uh, is here with us, uh, Kaylin Carr, of <laughs> course, you know, bringing Brampton to the world, uh, the voice that that helped explain the, the soccer explosion that has happened there and will continue to happen. I mean, Kyle Aaron is Brampton. Uh, TID, he's the top scorer in CONCACAF. By a wide margin, could be the top scorer in the world in World Cup qualifying, depending on what happens uh, against Panama in the final game. Kaylin, you've, uh, you've dug deep in the Great White North to tell some stories. When you think about this story that they're telling right now, what do you think? Well, it was somebody actually hit me up on Twitter and was like, the score is actually three, like all three goals yesterday, except for the own goal, were scored by Brampton guys <laughs> so you're like it was like Brampton three Jamaica one and I was like damn you, you might be able to do that against like you know whoever they play in the World Cup just play Brampton against the world um, but you know that was a really great story and I, I was sort of reflecting back on my conversation with Jonathan Osorio there um, and I sat down with him this was three years ago and to Goss's point about just how quickly this has turned he told me at the time that um, he didn't want to wait till 2026 because I went to ask him and was like, hey, this is like a story of Brampton. Like and this had happened on the women's side with Kadisha Buchanan and um, uh, Jennifer Lawrence and, and some top players that had come out of there. But um, sorry, Jessica Lawrence. Um, Ashley Lawrence. Ashley Lawrence. Jeez. OK. I seem to always mess up her name. Um, sorry about that. Uh <laughs> Anyways, um, 
I, uh, I had gone up there and seen basically that they had built such a good talent pool coming out of that one single place. And he told me, okay, we, we want to be the first to qualify, like not to be in by a, you know, host bid. Um, and I sort of looked at him and was like, all right, yeah, but like 2026 would be nice, right? Like going to the <laughs> World Cup no matter what. And, you know, I think it was revealing of the mentality of the group as far as just like this group of guys that have come through and wanting to like fully change the perception of Canada football um, from the men's side. And just like they've done that. And I think that attitude has shown up in their big matches against the U.S., against Mexico. They've not been afraid um, and I think they'll bring that to the World Cup. I think that's the type of team that they will have. And like looking at the infrastructure of it, like, I think the last time that they qualified was on a tiny sort of community pitch out in St. John's, Newfoundland in 1985. And now you're watching it in Toronto in a stadium that like is one where you've seen rocking for, you know, a decade plus now. And it's just like the infrastructure and the way not to have MLS sort of take anything for credit for what's happened in Canada. But um, I think too many people have made this this sort of commentary around like MLS helping other places in the region was such a silly uh, way to approach the idea that like this league has not been a part of growing. I mean, even you just look at the US team and all the players that have come through MLS academies and then onto Europe or even yesterday contributing, scoring goals, like being a part of things, our center backs, like you can look across the board and see what it's done. But I think from Canada's perspective, I think there's always been top talent like this. It's just maybe not had the kind of like, like you see in a lot of places around the world, maybe not had the infrastructure around it to help develop players um, and propel them onto this world stage. And now you're seeing, um, based on a lot of the work that's happened in Canada for a long time, but then sort of super jet fueled by um, the growth of the sport in the region over the last, you know, 10, 20 years, especially um, seeing the, the fruits of their labor. So it's uh, it was awesome to see. Um, and you could see the emotion from Fonzie Davies, who, by the way, was not there at all like, to see how they've just like you know, shedding tears on twitch yeah and we've seen him on twitch for a while now and hopefully we'll see him back on the pitch soon uh we have actually think just recently with with byron which is great to see um but um and then also jonathan osorio for me to kind of like see that roundabout moment of him kind of sitting with him and talking to him and seeing like that emotion of being like no i and believing it like we want to qualify and then seeing him qualify was like a really cool roundabout moment this feels like the beginning of the runway to, to keep on our like jet fuel like airplane analogy here. Doyle, th this just feels like the beginning, and that's a lot what I was thinking about yesterday of this sort of like moment where they realize this potential via a lot of different sources, and it just doesn't feel like there's an end point here. It doesn't feel like there's a wall that we can all see or understand where it's like, okay, well that's where the the progress starts stops. Or okay, they can be this good, but like oh when they get to the World Cup, like. Eh. You know, what are they going to do? Like, talent-wise, mentality-wise, coaching-wise, Canada are here to stay. And, and that's really exciting just within the region, but also within international soccer worldwide. Yeah. And, and I would argue the beginning of the runway was really um, Toronto coming into the league in 2007. And then they were one of the first MLS teams to really invest in uh, an academy and, and with – Montreal and, and Vancouver coming on, you know, into the league after that. And those two teams having been around for a while before, even before MLS, really, um, there was, there was that infrastructure that, that Kalen was sort of trying to talk about there. Little vacation, Russ Kalen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there too, was, too many luxury cruises in Cartagena, right? you know, like <laughs> sketchy travel moments, That's lost fair. some brain cells in customs. I That's know how that fair. goes. Very fair. Um, and they, you know, I think those three teams did a great job of developing a lot of these players. And then they also caught a little bit of lightning in a bottle with the likes of. Uh, Laren, Eustachio, and especially Jonathan David, who is the best forward in the region. Um, so it's, you know, and most of those guys are, are young enough where it's like, yeah, they're going to be around for 2026. They might be around for 2030. But also, if you look at the Canadian youth national teams and the types of players that Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal uh, are pushing through their academies, uh, and you could... Watch some of that at the GA Cup is coming up like next week, right? 
David Winking. Two weeks. Winking. Two weeks. Yeah. Are you going down to Frisco? I am. Where else would I be? Where else would you be? Name another place in the world I'd rather be. Do you not be. live in Frisco anyway? <laughs> He's got his second well, home. Uh, his yeah. soul. I do a time. His I do soul a time is share. in Frisco. Yeah, the yeah. soul is in Frisco. His body, like the husk of his body, just travels around the rest of the world. I do a timeshare. I own a space in Costa Rica, which I don't choose not to be at. I offer it up so that I can have space in Frisco. That's my uh, dream. But anyway, to to the, to your bigger point, like if you look at all of that, it 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 is the start. For Canada, they, they they have played over their heads, I think, a little bit at times in uh, in qualifying. Milan Borjan's been absolutely incredible. The say, especially in the, that winter window, the saves he made against Honduras and the U.S. changed draws or even losses into wins. And you need some of that luck to break through for the first time. The U.S. had that 30 years ago, um, 35 years ago in. Trinidad and Tobago to make that 1990 World Cup. And um, obviously this Canada team is a lot better than that U.S. team was. And it's not at all out of the realm of possibility to imagine this Canadian team getting out of the group, maybe even making a run to the, the quarterfinals. Because who, who would want to play this team? A team that just could absolutely rip you apart on the counterattack and is completely comfortable playing in that way. Um, but yeah, it's it's – it does feel like it's just the beginning, but they're off the runway. They're in the air now. They're they're flying. Uh, I'm gonna stop beating the metaphor up right there. I think we should <laughs> let that one sail off into the sunset. Oh, but it's, stop. it's been it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun to watch this out of Canada, uh, even as they were inflicting it upon the U.S. It, it was still a lot of fun to to watch a team that's this bought in and this talented and, and this absolutely ruthless at doing what they do. And one of the things I'll say, though, just about Canada is, uh, as Doyle said, um, this is a pipeline. This is not, I don't believe, a golden generation, although Alfonso Davies might be unique in that. I think it is the start. But the other part for Canada, which has never been the case, which will be interesting to watch now, is as a multicultural country, they've always had these dual national players. And they've lost the battle for having them play for Canada because of where the team has sat for such a long time. So even if adding the CPL and having three MLS teams with robust academies and potentially two teams in MLS next pro and all that doesn't continue to produce players at a high level, which would be surprising. You now have a legitimate stake. And when you look at the game against Canada or against Jamaica, you're looking at a ton of players who could have played for other national teams, right? Steven Ustakio is one of the big ones that stands out. Jonathan David, Milan Borjan, all these guys. And I think now, in that aspect, you've also entered a new conversation where Daniel Jebison's being ca- talked about for the England youth teams, and he's calling John Herdman still and saying, yeah, I'm really interested. I'd love to talk to you. So that has now shifted, and at a minimum, I think Canada's in a new place with that. We'll talk more about Canada. The nitty-gritty of this performance, there was a lot to dig into from that point of view, as well as reasonable expectations in the World Cup. But they're the only team with the check mark next to their name. It's pretty assured. Uh, that the U.S. will be there. We got to win. They got to draw, or they got to lose by what? It's it's five nothing or less, or is it six nothing or less? I mean, it's an unprecedented result at this point. Plus thirteen goal differential, seven for Mexico, three for Costa Rica. Do the math in my head. The U.S. would have to lose by six or more. Right. There you have so it. So if they lose five zero, they win. As Doyle has pointed out many times already, or I've seen once. around once. I tweeted once, it then once. it's it's making its rounds. Um, it was retweeted. So, so you know, congrats you just to keep you. Popping up. As a content farm, if the U.S. were to forfeit, they'd lose 3-0. I don't know how that works. I don't know how FIFA and CONCACAF would handle that. Yeah, I don't think you can just hit the forfeit button uh, <laughs> at a World Cup qualification like match and have that like go down. But PlayStation, you just like... Yeah, like, ah, you know what? I'm just going to rage quit this one. We're, you know what? I'm just going to unplug our controller and uh, take our trip to Qatar and call it good. Uh, let's jump into uh, the U.S. and the performances that we've not yet talked about on this show. Because uh, we gave you the preview on Wednesday, of course, then U.S.-Mexico played at Azteca on Thursday, and then uh, on Sunday night, U.S. 5-1 winners against Panama and Orlando. A little deja vu there with an added goal from the last cycle. Let's start with U.S.-Mexico and just kind of give quick quick takes on that. It's been beaten into the ground. We've already done this. I mean, the, I would say the one disappointment for me is just that this is this epic sort of, I don't know, it's like a... It's a bucket list game for players, for fans, for coaches, for anybody involved in the game in both countries in this region. It has been for a long time, and it's given us a lot of moments that we'll never forget, whether they be goals or you know coming togethers or you know 
little uh, red cards, drama, uh, you know, eliminations at the hands of another one in the World Cup, etc. All these different things that have sort of been packaged into this rivalry, and in particular, into games in places like Columbus or in Mexico City at the Azteca. I just felt a little bit wistful, a little bit disappointed that we didn't get that moment this time around. And whether it be that because there wasn't a, a crowd like we've seen throughout the years, you know, in the 100,000 zone, or the weather is nighttime, so it's much more hospitable to visiting teams, or Mexico's sort of lack of home field advantage that they felt for a little while now, it just doesn't seem as scary as it did before, or Mexico's lack of form. Really, the marquee moment from this one is like Gio Reyna's run. You know, like other than that, like there's some misses, but you don't. Ten years from now, twenty years from now, you don't think you don't look back and talk about this game and be like, oh man, when Jordy oh, Pifak oh, missed oh, that oh. or Christian Mexican, Pulisic did. Mexican media are call, we're calling it a, a miracle save from Memo, the, the Pulisic Ooh. shot, right? So that's the perspective from. Is it? But how long does that? How long does that linger? And and does that enter your imagination? I guess the point I'm making is that I wanted in what was probably going to be the final sort of do or die, everything's on the line qualifier between these two countries because both qualify, we assume, automatically for 26. And then also the assumption is that the World Cup will grow and be bigger. Like, we just didn't get that, didn't get that memory to yeah. sort of file away. Or maybe I'm, maybe I didn't get that and that's what I'm frustrated by, but other people did. I don't know. Zero zero is good. The performance from the U.S. was good. We didn't finish our chances. Mexico had more chances than I think we give them credit for, and they were pretty flubby with those as well. But it just it it left me it left me wanting a little bit more. Am I wrong to feel that way? Uh, I understand. I think that is indicative of how the game went. That there was more on the table for the U.S. But I think missing a little bit of that quality, like Weston McKinney out there, you would think maybe he would find a moment if he was in this match. Having a fully fit and healthy Gio Reyna from the start, Brendan Aronson, no desk. Like, we were not at full strength. Um, and even still had moments to, had the best moments to win the match. And when we've seen the U.S. play against Mexico, we've sort of become accustomed to, in the big matches, ha having a U.S. player find one of those moments. And yeah, Christian and PFOC both missed their opportunities. And then Christian, you saw the way, I think he really took that on his shoulders and took it to heart and then showed up in a big way in the next match. But uh, the real story is that there was that point was super valuable because if we don't have that point, uh, we, aren't we not in trouble heading into this next match, Joel? No, the U.S. would just need a, a result. If the U.S. hadn't taken that point against, uh, against Mexico, they would be going to uh, Costa Rica, presumably with a pretty well-rested first team squad to face a Costa Rican side um, that hasn't been able to rotate at all through two games. And you would need what out of it? Just a draw. A tie or a win. Just a draw though? See that's yeah, I, this is, I, 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 I don't know what's happening right now. completely on Kalen's side on what's this. What's happening? Yeah. Like to eliminate even the possibility you talk, not to eliminate no, pressure because there still I, I is pressure. I, so, it, but like, you shut the door like the, the yeah, road absolutely. is closed. You know what I mean? Like, I mean it, it's not it's not entirely but like yeah. Oh, okay. Our history in Costa Rica as well does not, it's not give great. me a lot of confidence that we're going to go down there and just like hold on Pretty for a point team, and though. we look Pretty at what team. happened at the last World Cup qualifying and what do we need on the road? Oh, great win in Orlando. Now we're just going down to, you know, wherever, Cuba, <laughs> trying to get a point. What could go wrong, right? So I think the lesson was learned to like shut the door, take every opportunity that you can, shut the door as, as soon as you can. They could have likely only, they could have likely come out with three points. They at least get one. Then you do the business at home. Now this last game becomes, you know, like not a, uh, you, you know, a, a golasso is not going to change things necessarily. Like you would need four or five, you need six of them. Right. <laughs> so I, I think that part for me is the point where we be to go back to the original question. It's hard to want more necessarily from that, but I do think it is a sign of progress. And also it was just fun to watch the Mexican media freak out over Gio Reyna's run and like the comparisons to Maradona. And like, I saw people going crazy with the uh, comparisons to Bergkamp and this last one. And it's like, it's a nice feeling as a U.S. fan to like have players, one that can make special moments like Reyna and Pulisic did in these last two matches. Um, two, know that there's a little bit behind the door, I think, especially with Reyna, who's like, I don't even think he's really even close to his 
peak or coming or even really entering it yet at his age and his stage and his development, um, which is really exciting. And we haven't had him for a lot of this qualifying process. So getting him back into the side, uh, I know he was, I think, sick in this last one even. Um, so maybe we'll see more of him against Costa Rica. But um, that for me is like, yeah, I, I think Burhalter has, has hit every note right this uh, this cycle, which was a tricky one. And I understand the back and forth as far as how do you approach this or how do you approach the next one, but you can't argue with the results. Like you go down to Azteca, you get a point, you come home convincing in the first half, even four nil. Um, he's pulled every string right so far. I, I was actually more impressed with the performance in Mexico than I think you guys were. I, w- I would argue that I was more impressed with the performance than necessarily the result. Because I thought for 80 minutes, the U.S. were pretty clearly the better team. You're, mm-hmm. you're right that Mexico had one or two half chances that they flubbed. I think it was Tecatito had one um, maybe midway through the first half that he, he just took an awful touch. And uh, Zach Steffen was able to cover it up. And then at the end, once the U.S. switched to that 5-4-1, um, just immediately they were able to put more pressure on. But I thought, like, other than that, for 80 minutes, the U.S. were clearly – just better on the ball, better off the ball, more dangerous. And w- what's really been true this window, um, and maybe we'll use this to segue into the into the Panama game, they they were better at using the possession that they got and turning that into penetration and danger. And that has been um, maybe the biggest issue for the U.S. throughout qualifying is like, I, I really like Berhalter's system. I like his ideas about the game. Um, I think the defensive results speak for themselves. This team's given up eight goals in 13 games, um, and it's been uh, pretty smothering. And if you look at the, the whole history of Berhalter's team against uh, Berhalter's U.S. national team against teams in, we'll say, the, the top 50 of the ELO ratings, they're, they're twice as good as Klinsman, Arena, and Bradley combined, defensively speaking. Um, so the, the argument for the system has always been based there, and the argument against it has been like, okay, it's so rigid going forward that it does not allow the attackers the freedom to actually create attacking depth. Other than Tim Weah, nobody gets in behind. Nobody puts that kind of pressure on the team. And suddenly in these two games, in both in Mexico and then especially against Panama, after the first 10 minutes against Panama anyway, um, they were just put, they were relentless making those runs and putting pressure. Um, and it looked like it, it, it looked like it had kind of clicked, even though I think you could say in this Panama game, the U.S. were sloppy. They weren't great building out. Uh, it was kind of an ugly game. I thought the the six holdovers from that Mexico game had a lot of them had dead legs and they weren't as sharp as they uh, typically are. Um, but the the overall sort of grasp of what the structure means and how to attack from within it um, really seems to have clicked. And uh, when that much talent on the field is suddenly clicking together, you get performances like five one in a must win qualifier. Let's put a bow on uh, Mexico, and I'll just sort of finish by saying, you know, Doyle gave a very, you know, layered, detailed tactical analysis there. I just wanted to have bragging rights till the end of time on Mexico. I'm just like, oh, what about the Azteca? What was the last game? You took the L? Yeah, okay, fine. Didn't happen for us, but we're still in a good position. Dave, get us started on uh, on U.S. Panama. 5-1. Doyle mentioned it. It did feel a little bit nervy in the first 10 minutes, but once the, like, once the, the tide sort of shifted, it was absolutely rampant from the U.S. in the first half, and it, it was fun. I think it was one of those moments we've been waiting for for a long time and in a high-leverage moment, in a moment where they had to do it, to see those players deliver, to see the, the sort of joy on their faces, to feel that joy ourselves, to know that the World Cup was that much more in reach. It was, it was fun. Yeah, and it was, I think, predictable to an extent, and obviously CONCACAF's insanity, so you never want to say it totally is. But this is a Panama team that doesn't have a ton of depth that's almost been playing outside themselves most of the qualifying cycle and in the reverse from the U.S. had been building towards this. Of like They've been close to slipping numerous times over the last few windows and no one's really pushed them over that edge. And then 
on the flip side, the U.S. has depth, even with all their injuries, that Panama can't match. And so you talk about that mix of guys from the Azteca, not from the Azteca for the U.S. that they can go to. And you come into a game like this and Panama comes out strong, credit to them. Uh, and I think the U.S. always knew that they had another gear that Panama couldn't reach. And it was about getting a finish or two, right? That's, uh, as Doyle said, that's been the U.S.'s problem. But you look at what you got from Shaq Moore, getting off a plane from Germany, not being a part of this call-up, and just playing like his hair is on fire down the right wing. Luca Della Torre as well, who steps in, and this game fits so perfectly for him. Of Once Panama got behind, they, were, they had to press in spots, and he, he loves to glide by guys on his first or second touch. And so he was in heaven with the way that game ended up playing out. And Jesus Ferreira as well, who picks up those spots, starts making life hard for a back line. And you always knew the U.S. was going to be dangerous on set pieces because they have a Walker Zimmerman and a Miles Robinson in this team, uh, as well as the service that you can get. And so for the U.S., yeah, probably a little fortunate that Annabelle Godoy forgot his job that he's been doing his entire life <laughs> and had to do it properly in that moment. No, he remembered his job. It's just he forgot there's VAR now. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Absolutely. The first thing I thought of when that play happened, by the way, was when Darren Seren uh, bit Josie Altador in a quarter yeah. kick at a gold cup, and there was no call after it. <laughs> um, and that's, that's the difference in CONCACAF. But the U.S., what they needed in this game was to get on top and make Panama feel like there was no hope and give up. And that's exactly what the U.S. did. They never let up the moment they got the goal. They attacked from different angles, through different pieces. They made life impossible. They got the crowd on their side, on top of them. And that's what we had talked about for the last week plus, was what is your team to be able to get on the front foot, be aggressive, play in the other team's final third. And I thought it was really impressive on one of, now I can't even remember all the different goals. On one of the goals, though, it was a final third moment where the U.S. had to recycle possession, make second runs, make third runs, which they've struggled the with. Goal. It was the third goal. It was goal. the third goal. Was and it Ariola's was, goal? It was a 15, yeah, no, it was uh, it, it was Ferreras. It was a 15 oh, pass, right. it was a 15 pass buildup in the final third after Ferreira had made a run over the top to create that attacking depth I was talking about. So there was no, I mean, the U.S. has been slow to build from back to front in, in throughout qualifying. Second and third goal were balls over the top, first to Pulisic on the second goal, and the second one to Ferreira on the, on the third goal. And once the U.S. got into the attacking third, then they settled back into their build patterns, and they were really patient on that one. But I do think it's worth mentioning that like most of those passes came from Ferreira, Ariola, De La Torre, uh, and Shaq Moore. The four guys with fresh legs, the four guys who hadn't played at the Azteca, and it was just absolutely killer soccer. And especially De La Torre, once he got on the ball in that half space, able to turn and drive the ball five, six yards, and make the Panamanian defenders step to him and then thread Shaq Moore through. Um, I stepped all over you right there, but that, no, that, you're goal, good. that goal got me absolutely juiced because it was everything Burhalter wants in how he wants his team to play, but it was also a lot of the stuff that a lot of us were calling for where it was like, don't always be so methodical in building mm -hmm. from the back. If the team is disorganized, if the opponent's disorganizing itself, trying to get pressure to you, punish them with one ball. And the U.S. did that twice against Panama. We haven't seen that out of the U.S. until this window, I don't think. Um, it was really good to see it. And that, yeah, that goal got me juiced. Shaq Moore, not by choice, but I thought it was really smart from Greg, and, and we talked a lot about the rotation. What teams are going to play in Azteca? How does that then carry over to Panama? I thought it was smart that he did save, in essence, Ferreira, Areola, and Luca De La Torre for this moment. It felt like to me. He held those guys back, and he said, okay, this is the team that's going to go tight again. Hey, Pepe, Pifak, can you do it? We're not saving you for that Panama game. We have the guys we think will be able to disorganize them and make the runs you're talking about and be direct and have the chemistry that they had in this match and also bring out the best in Christian Pulisic, which we saw. So I, I thought that was, if, if you're going to rotate, and that's the decision that Greg made, we're going for it in Mexico. He said it. We wanted to be the team that made history. They didn't quite get it done, but they had the horses left over to be fresh, to have those cutting-edge moments against Panama. So I thought that was really good squad management on his part. Some of it's not by choice. Some of it you have yellow cards. Some of it Shaq Moore has to come in because obviously COVID runs amok and you have you know Reggie Cannon not available to play. But, but in the end, 
worked well. Well, let's also say the way the whole thing went down was who did he choose in that moment? And I think one of the things we've seen from Burhalter in this window is, or sorry, in this qualifying cycle is he, he heavily values what he sees when he has a player in his group, right? Jordy P Fox scores 17 goals in Switzerland, doesn't get called back in because of what Burhalter and his staff, I think saw when he was with the group last year. And then on the flip side, Joe Scally's playing in the Bundesliga. You lose a right back. Shaq Moore performed well in your group last year at the Gold Cup. He's the first one that gets called back in. I think there's clearly a level of value there from Burhalter in the way he manages it. But he obviously picked the right guy because they won the game and he played well. So, so you have to the, give him credit for handling it. The other thing to, to mention, like, I, I still think that either Scally or Dewan Jones should have been called in just to add, you know, breaking case of emergency depth. And like it's one of my small gripes with Burhalter at this point is like he, he's not he's not as willing to do that as as I would like to see from him. That said, Joe Scally, the the, the discussion about Joe Scally has been kind of insane. He he's played five no, professional no, wait, games no, on U.S. national team Twitter. Yeah, right. He's played five professional games as a right back. Five. He has spent most of this year. The first half of it, he spent most of it as a left wing back and the second half of it, he spent most of it on the bench. Like he, he played his way out of a regular role for Munchen Gladbach. Uh, and like, it's not surprising teenagers struggle in most leagues. And I'm not saying he's a bad player. Again, I wish he was there to at least provide depth, but the, the way the discussion around this was framed was insane to me. Like this is not Gio Reyna starting every game for Dortmund, man. Like he he's a he's a backup wing back slash fullback with five games as a right back. Shaq Moore's a good player. They got a good performance out of him. Uh, Burhalter absolutely made the right call. In it, like I, it's not even debatable. Well, Jaylen, we've, we've, I, I, we've, wait, before we go on, we do have to okay, say Scally is back in the team. We haven't even talked to Pulisic. We're nerding Just out. hang on, on real quick. <laughs> we have to mention that Scally is back in the team, and he has 19 starts this year. So he, we do have so to he, mention that. He has two starts in the past three months, and they came because yeah. Liner was sick. Fair. Fair, but I'm just I'm just giving the other side of the Fair. argument. Okay, just in no, case. I'm not saying he's a bad player. Again, he should have been there. I think he has a better chance of making the World Cup final in Qatar than Shaq Moore does. But the discussion around the decision for this game was insanity. It was Agreed. absolute also, insanity. If you pull up Doyle's shorts on his right leg, there's a Shaq Moore tattoo. So that should also be <laughs> I'm disclosed. A big Shaq Moore guy. Big Shaq Moore guy. Caitlin, we haven't talked to Christian Pulisic. What are we doing here? The man <laughs> scores a hat trick. He, he scores arguably a, a top five, maybe top three goal in the history of this national team. This was a game after which you sort of mentioned it. You could see him slamming the turf in Azteca. You could see the frustration. He's talked repeatedly about the weight that he feels as a leader, as somebody to, I don't know, you know, to, to, to deliver the U.S. to where they want to be, to deliver himself where they want to be. I mean, I still remember the images in Cuba of him head down, distraught. You heard all about, you know, sort of the aftermath in, in private that that team went through and what he was going through, and, and that was a formative moment for him. And he put so much pressure on himself to come out, to get three goals, two from the spot, but you got to score those. And then uh, just a, a wonderful goal. I, I don't know if that touch is completely intentional, the first one. The second one absolutely is. The finish is just the epitome of calm, collected, and cool. That was sort of the moment where I, like, released and was like, oh, yeah, we're doing this. Like, and we're doing it in style. This is wonderful. This is everything. This is what you want as a U.S. national team fan from Christian Pulisic. Well, okay, just to go back to these guys, because <laughs> I, I was I was <laughs> drinking all that in. I was loving it. Uh, is, like, he? I think Berhalter let the play, trusted the players to make the – choices as far as his lineup decisions go in some ways where like Tyler Adams doesn't get a yellow card right he's now gone through two matches that way the two center backs structurally are sound you have those two those three as the base Musa plays again he trusts Christian again hands him the um, captain armband which was something that kind of got a little bit of a pickup I think on Twitter leading up to the match Um, and maybe something that you say is like a little bit silly where I think Burhalter came out and said that they have a captain's council and sometimes kind of rotated around it. Um, to me, you know, Tyler Adams is kind of 
the de facto captain of the team just in general, the way he kind of like operates and the way he is. He doesn't need an armband, whether he has it or doesn't have it. Um, but I thought it was clever in a way to give Christian the armband for this game. Um, and I think he did seem to respond anyways from the Azteca and maybe heard some of the commentary around him not or even just his own pr internal pressure of just he's tend to found those moments against Mexico specifically and wasn't able to do it in this one kind of was probably uh seemed like he was extra hyped on this one because when he's when he plays like that um you know he he is a handful <laughs> um <laughs> and sometimes he puts a little bit maybe too much pressure on himself or tries to do too much uh, I didn't see that in this game and He's just got a really nice partnership with Jedi coming down the flank, even on the one where Walker plays the ball over the top on Ariel's goal. Um, he stretches the field, gets in behind, gets fouled, but the layoff he draws attention and sucks so much energy towards that side that opens up that cross from Jedi, um, who is excellent again. But they, they have a really good partnership. But from Christian, for me, it's like he can beat, and I think even Tata said it, like he can score at will. And he's basically, I think, Geo as well, um, probably, and, and I would add West into that mix, like guys that can really just change a game individually. Um, but we needed him big. And I think from the last group that missed out on the World Cup, I always thought, I remember thinking at the time, like, oh, what, what, how will this impact Christian's career, right? I, I was worried about that. Um, clearly, it's not been an issue. He's won the Champions League. He's uh, made a huge move to England. He's done fantastic over there. And then um, but I think he, he knows what that felt like. And so I think having that um, leadership and perspective is incredibly valuable. De I know DeAndre is the only one to play in the World Cup. But, um, but yeah, I mean, he, he took it on his shoulders. And, like, that little Meg after he finds the ball, maybe the first touch, he didn't know much about it. But to be able to keep your composure to find the ball and then have the composure to kind of tuck it in between the guy's legs, I mean, come on. That was just sick. And uh, as you mentioned, Kaylin, I Greg talked about after the game why he made him captain and that connection to it and sort of like uh, I think he's managing this whole time. How do I get Christian to stop putting so much on his shoulders but also be a leader and carry us? And it's sort of this balance that he has to figure out, and it's one of the things that I've talked about for the last year and a half coming into this of like there is no history except 1989 of like this many young players having to lead a team. And young players not having people to lean on, right? Landon lent on Claudio Reyna and Brian McBride and John O'Brien and Paul, like all those guys, right? And then Clint could lean on Landon. And it's always gone that way. And that's a huge responsibility for these players. And this was the moment that you wanted, Weeby, of talking about, like, what are you going to remember later? Is, yep. a, is a hat trick from Christian at home? Is the crowd jumping all over them? Us getting emails, should Orlando be the home field for the U.S. because they always win there? Oh, we got emails too? Because they, f they f like flooded our Twitter as well. <laughs> like every Orlando fan in the history of Orlando was like, I need to tweet at them and tell them that they have to be in, in Orlando. Yeah, and, and, and credit to them. They were rocking, and it, was, it, it looked epic. Um, and, and that was the moment when we, we've sort of spent the week talking about legacies because of the Azteca game, because of what it meant. These are legacy moments, and Christian sort of putting this game away for the U.S. is one. To bounce back, not make the World Cup, and then get them in. This is really, I think, his best international moment, maybe alongside the Nations League final. Um, and so he needed this. I think fans sort of needed this to be like, it's safe to anoint him in the way that everyone's been trying to since he was a kid at Dortmund, and Jurgen Klinsmann threw him all the field in Columbus. Uh, and that was pretty cool to see because that's – Sort of what we all sign up for, right? Is that was the LeBron experience of like, here's expectations. Holy crap, this guy reached it and then outdid it. And that's sort of what you're starting to get for Pulisic as he enters his prime. Would you make of, of this of this game in particular for Christian? We've talked a lot in the past about okay, positionally, where is he best? Like, okay, yeah. the pressure he's feeling, but also the performance is not being up to snuff. Do you feel like this is sort of a inflection point, a turning point? For him, a delivery both for himself and for the rest of the program and for the fans of what he can and will be through what will be the now the biggest, what, it's March, you know what, we're talking about the next nine months of, of his career and his life, potentially a defining moment uh, for his career? I, I hope it's actually not a defining moment for his career. I, I hope that there's so much more and better left to come that, that you know, only the, the hardcore nerds like us remember this as a defining moment. Um, and, and I will say, I don't, 
I, I actually don't think he, he played that well from open play. I think he could play so much better than he has. And I think he has for the, the U.S. Uh, in the past. Um, the big thing here was that when, when the U.S. needed someone to step up and convert the penalties, he st- stepped up and did it. And then in the second half, the game was already won, but there was a chance to, to create something truly special and remind everyone you know, why he's a $70 million striker, or winger rather, and why he plays uh, for a club like Chelsea, and, and he did. And he put the ball in the back of the net, and that's frankly something he has struggled to do throughout qualifying. Um, what I liked most, though, were the few times that he was direct and um, dangerous off the ball because that's when that's when Christian Pulisic is at his best uh, for club and for country. If you go back and you watch qualifiers from, you know, 2016, 2017, when he was scoring a goal a game, basically, the game wasn't running through him. He was he was running in behind or he was comboing off of Josie Altidore. Um, the game was running through other guys and he was able to use that use the gravity of the ball um, to his advantage in that defenses are naturally pu- pulled toward the ball, and, and Pulisic's best attribute is that he he understands where space is away from the ball and how to be there at the right time. Um, and it's how he scores goals for Chelsea, and it's how he used to score goals for the U.S., and he hasn't done a lot of that um, for the U.S. in, in qualifying. And In uh, fairness, he did it at the Azteca. There were times yesterday. He did. It, yeah, it, and that, he that's what was brutal about that miss. Right. And he actually, he also, like, I actually thought his best performance of qualifying was his sub-performance against Mexico back in autumn, back in November. Mm-hmm. Um, because, like, the game was already, the flow of the game was already established at that point, And he wasn't going to step onto the field and make everything way too narrow and start pointing at his feet drag defenders to the ball like he has a, a tendency to do. And even in this one uh, against Panama, he was doing that a little bit. And that one, because the rhythm of the game was already there, uh, he he was able to just sort of slide in and be a super dangerous off-the-ball winger. And we saw some of that I- I against Panama. I I still think we need to see more of that from Gio Reyna, or from, Gio, from, from Christian Pulisic. <laughs> and I, what I was thinking is, like, I wonder if Reyna's in central midfield mm-hmm. – yeah, if that changes the way that Pulisic operates, because like at times it feels like it's a it's a matter of trust. Like he doesn't necessarily trust the guys in in central midfield to get him the ball where he wants it in space in behind. And maybe if the personnel is a little different, maybe you know now having been through the Concacaf battles, he'll be a little more willing to be a guy who play like Tim Weah, create depth create chances, um, trust the system, and don't always come back to the midfield stripe and then turn and try to go 1v3 in the central channel. Again, there was there was some of that against Panama, more, I think, than we've seen in the past from him, and I hope it, it bodes well for what we get out of Christian Pulisic going forward because when he plays like that, he's unstoppable. He Reyna had that zero. one where he plays it through to Christian, and Christian tries to square it to uh, Jesus, who, who was just off it. But I mean, that's it was delatory. It was delatory. Oh, that, was it? That I squared it to Jesus. Yeah, but but yeah, like that oh, type of play. Yeah, yeah, that's the type of that's the type of motion though, where you have that playmaker to be able to play inside. I I, I think the I think we're going to talk about it later, but I think the Reyna positional choice is an do interesting now, man. one. Let's do it now. Yeah, I mean, he can play at a lot of different spots, right? Um, he can play out wide. He can be dynamic and cut inside. Um, he is not the type to obviously go to the end line necessarily. He's more a type that's going to come in and combine and create those, um, those like, wonderful little slip balls and passes. But I think inside, um, especially uh, to have somebody to partner closer to, get him closer to Christian and create that type of partnership, I think could really, really work. Um, it kind of depends who else you're going to play around him and how does that fit, I guess, ideally with Weston. And then what does that do to Musa? Right. Um, but Tyler behind that, I think obviously is without question, but I, I like the idea of getting Reyna more involved and more like, 
touches around Christian because the main thing where I see Christian running into trouble is when he gets the ball and he's static. When he's just standing and then he gets a guy, he stands, faces a guy up. We've seen it happen with Canada where they were able to kind of frustrate him with Richie Larea or whoever it is just to like just start needling and kicking him, facing away from his own goal. How many fouls has he suffered facing not towards the goal, right? Like a couple times he's getting got fouls running towards guys, but a lot is closer towards the midfield stripe and teams know just to like get him double down, triple down, whatever it takes. Whereas where Christian's most dangerous is in space, moving with the ball, isolated, one-on-one. Um, but you need somebody else to kind of suck some of that inertia away from him and create some space in behind. And if you have more dynamic players, breaking lines, the way we saw Gio running through the midfield, that's going to draw a lot of attention, right? And then that suddenly opens up. So when that ball is slipped through, you hope that Christian's on the end of that to make that final decision. So um, I, I like the idea of Reyna playing more in the middle. Um, but it, it starts to become a little bit, bit of a puzzle piece because we're trying to figure out exactly how this all fits. We've, I know people have talked about maybe Weah going to the nine or who's going to, you know, the nine is still a big question mark for me. Um, but getting more of your top players closer to each other to build some relationships together with Jedi running around the flank, I think that's an interesting thing I think they're going to have to look at. Give me the, the best possible, like, you know, like, matchups matter, health matters, availability matters, suspension matters. But you have an opportunity to play a World Cup game in which you think you can put your absolute best attacking team on the field. Who is in that front five, essentially? Because we're saying, and, and it's, I think it's assumed, there's no question, it's Tyler in the defensive midfield role, and then really it's Weston in one of those eight roles. So who are the four? How do you organize that ahead of those two guys to get the best Moose, out of this team? Musa and Pulisic, I think, are locks as well to me. Uh, and I would say... You're probably in a situation where you're trying to figure out if you want to play Wea as a nine, where I don't actually think he's as good. Um, I think what we've seen at Lille and he doesn't like is yeah, that he doesn't like playing there, right? He but the question is talent or not talent. Like in my mind, still, I would start Wea, but if that's keeping Rain on the bench, how do you handle that? And if that means this was sort of the debate we had on the live watch along show whenever we did it when the U.S. played Mexico, was like. Are you going to shoehorn Jesus Ferreira or, I don't know, Pepe or Zardes or Pifak into a team because their natural position is at that spot where you have a hole? Or are you going to get the most talented players on the field that you can? Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that. I still think what we see from the U.S. from Wednesday night on is going to be better than what we've seen. I think in the past, the U.S. was built to battle and, and work in CONCACAF qualifying and then sort of maybe be outmatched at times at a world cup level on the nice fields and the nice facilities and all that. I think this team actually fits that better. So I think they're actually going to look better going over the next eight months in the friendlies. We see them play as well in the world cup. You can play more of Greg soccer, I think, and what he wants to see. So that will change things as well. Um, but if all healthy, uh, honestly, I, I, I don't even, I don't know the answer uh, is what I would <laughs> say, but I, I, I find it hard to take way off the field, the way he affects the team. Agree. I, I like the way Weas. I like the way Weas stretches the field, kind of to give that balance towards Christian, right? To to suck teams to that other side of the pitch, um, and give some of that verticality over there. And but I, I can't see dropping Musa either. That's the, that's the challenging part. <laughs> so it's like, how do you how do you fit all these pieces? I could see depending on the opponent, maybe switching where you get you use Reyna in different ways. Or I, I don't know if it's crazy, but we've looked at. Jesus Ferreira as the, as the nine, right? Could could you play with Gio under in that position could, where he drops plays? You know, can kind of roam a little bit after and the performance get that, that Jesus Ferreira had put in. Like, but should shouldn't like is he not yeah, the starting number nine now? Kind of I think he I should. Feel. I think he has a big opportunity in Costa Rica. Yeah. I, I think when you look at that match, he should definitely be the nine for that and continue. You know, for. While some might say, okay, we just need a result or whatever, like if you're Ferreira, you're like, this is my chance to continue holding yeah. on to this spot and claiming that um, and ha making someone rip it away from you. Um, I'm just not sure if he thinks he's always a nine or if he really – the thing is, is he, he's just such a smart player that he can play – he can do so much. Like he's good off – he works hard, he, he fights, he you know can – 
he, he's not going to win balls necessarily, but he's going to make it difficult so that he's going to win the knockdown or put us in our better position to do it. His combination play where he tucks in underneath is draw, is good enough that technically that he draws the center backs to drop a little bit deeper, which opens up space and behind. So he fits the system really well. And then when he's gotten his chances, um, for the most part, he's been able to take them, um, which is not something we can say about the nines in our pool right now. But I think overall, we just kind of have to admit the nine position is not where we hoped it would be right for where we're at right now in the cycle. And I don't know if it's going to get there. And that's where the question marks start to say, well, could you maybe fit a nut? If you have this problem where you're trying to fit Wea and Musa and um, Pulisic and like, you know, all these different guys, Aronson to list, like, can you, if you have depth at other positions, maybe do you start to tempt uh, some ideas of like maybe fitting a different piece into that position? But if you're, if you're Ferreira, you hold on for dear life. Yeah, I'd like to see Ferreira and Gio be able to play, you know, Ferreira at the nine and Gio underneath them centrally. I'd like to see how, you know, it's not just Pulisic that will level up in that situation. I mean, Ferreira's going to drop in and create. I was a little bummed for Jesus that he, fin- he didn't finish that one off the right flank. It's a little ball across the top. It's a little bit behind him, and he puts it over the top. Just for his confidence, just for the, for the U.S. to have a little bit more of like stability and feeling like okay, well maybe that is the guy. He has taken advantage of these two opportunities, so that's a bummer to me. But I'd like to see those two guys interchange, and what that also means for Weston, because we haven't seen Weston now for a little while because of injuries. We don't know where he'll be after this summer going into the fall. But it, it's completely open. Like in some ways, that's it's, it's good team. It's good team problems. It's yeah. talented team problems, right? Like is it, these are the problems you want to have as a manager. It's not like who can you trust? It's like, other than the nine, you almost have too many guys. Right. That, who do you, you pull trust? out? Yeah. I, I will say uh, this, like, cause I think rain has already been to compared to Diego Maradona this week. So I think it, it's only right to say, maybe you go five in the back, Beckenbauer style sweeper, free roll for <laughs> Gio Reyna. He just finds the game at will. And then maybe you play him up top, like Pele. And now you've got all three in the Congo. We, we promised uh, Canada down the line here, but, Final point here from you, Doyle, and we'll we'll keep it rolling. Real quick, the, the biggest differential between this cycle and last cycle is the defense. Um, the the U.S. obviously last night was, was spectacular, but the U.S. had not scored more than two goals against any team in qualifying, uh, other than Honduras, who are historically terrible in in this Ocho. Uh, like the the biggest differential is the defense. And that, to me, really felt like it started to change in that October, or this started to be the case in that October window when Walker Zimmerman got called in as an emergency last-minute sub, right? He was not originally in that camp. Uh, And he got his opportunity, and he took it with both hands. And he's been first choice ever since then. Uh, Zimmerman and Miles Robinson have now played I think it's eight games together. The U.S. are seven wins and one draw, the draw being the one at the Azteca uh, on Thursday night, uh, with two goals allowed. Um, One of those goals was last night against Panama. That goal came with Robinson already off the pitch. So they like in eight games, the U.S. have allowed one goal when – the Walker Zimmerman Miles Robinson center back pairing is out there. Now they haven't been perfect. Remember the the giveaway that Miles had against Costa Rica that turned into a, a breakaway, a very very slow breakaway for Brian Ruiz um, that Miles was able to run down. Uh, Zimmerman had the giveaway in uh, at the Azteca that turned into that half that flubbed chance really for Tecatito midway through the first half. There there have been a couple of moments like that. But the job that these guys have been able to do, shutting teams down and shutting teams out, has provided the foundation um, for the rest of this team to kind of figure it out going forward and have nights where they can't put the ball in the back of the net um, and still get results that put the U.S. in second place with a 99.9% chance of qualifying uh, for Qatar and going to the World Cup. So just, yeah. you know, Walker Zimmerman's, like, to me, he and Tyler Adams are the two captains of this team. And it, it was even on that first goal for the U.S., um, like, he got pulled down in a 
face slapped in the box by Annabelle Godoy. And play goes on. Nothing's called. And eventually the, the ball goes into touch, and Zimmerman picks it up and does not let play restart. Bear hugs it. Says, hey, go look. This is going to happen. <laughs> yeah. This is going like, to like That's that, the sort of VAR video review CONCACAF no, no, like wherewithal that we need. Yeah. Honestly, though, like understanding video yeah. review is, is a, a little hidden skill. Not even hidden. Also going down. In the modern down. game now. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. But, oh. I mean, so all that is smart. I just like the, those guys deserve a, a ton of credit. I know like we, we talk about attackers in midfielders more often because, frankly, it's more fun than talking about defenders. That's a Kalen Carr take right there. Um, <laughs> but like they, they have provided the foundation. They've been amazing, the two of them. Uh, and, and you know, I agree. And the only thing I'd add to that is just like it's I always think center back is a relationship position. Um, where so much of it does come from having that understanding and you do need minutes and volume to be able to do that. There's still a couple kinks, like, as you mentioned, Doyle, and like even in this last match, there's the one even when you add in the goalkeeper because you have to add in the goalkeeper and the six to that yeah. conversation as well too, where it's like, Zach, is he coming? Is you know he, is he leaving the ball? Walker left one where maybe an, another striker is able to kind of get in and nick one there. Um, so still a couple kinks there, but the idea that like they've pretty much conceded almost nothing um, in their time um, and been able to figure out each other's tendencies so fast. Um, and then I think even their distri- distribution as well um, has been much better than I think a lot of people would have said when you're leading into like, well, I mean, the- people would say those were like knocks on them. And I think they've, they've been strong points. Second and third goal that those balls over the top, the first one yeah. came from Walker Zimmerman. The second one came from miles Robinson. It, like you're defending you're, If you're going to be, competitive a team that, that has eyes on a quarterfinal or maybe more go in the world cup like and y- your team's going to be under pressure defensively at times and your your center backs are going to have to have the ability to play those kinds of passes that that hurt teams and they've shown that do we have any sort of goalkeeper question marks that's a yes. last point that that i'll allow us zach to make stephan, on the u.s zach stefan was was flapping at crosses last night like he was dropping stuff like it, it, Last night was a was a the on the watch along show midway through the first half we put out a poll with with the you know the the users and you know who do you trust more Matt Turner or Zach Steffen and it was like ninety to ten Zach Steffen or Matt Turner rather the thing is though I I still think that Burhalter is a Zach Steffen guy um, I, I'm not sure it, that that Turner, is going to is Turner in a tough spot because he's injured and he's leaving in the summer. Clearly, and he may yeah. not be getting the – I mean, I, look, we, with Stefan, maybe games don't matter. So this is like a weird debate because neither of them are, are going to be come World Cup time everyday starters. You would think maybe that's – maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe maybe one of them wins the job at, at these massive clubs, but it kind of feels like it's going to go on trust. And, you know, I understand that. I would actually – some nervy moments. If we just are having a dumb semantic debate, which is what we're about yeah, to do, uh, <laughs> there was nothing Turner could do with the Revs to, to overtake Stefan. He can, if he does, earn the starting spot at Arsenal, overtake him. So I actually think, yeah, he's in a tough spot because he has to do a thing that most of us don't expect him to do. But there is actually an avenue for him to get in there now, right? But clearly him being the starter for the Revs and, and accomplishing everything he accomplished last year. Go Revs. Uh, I just realized I was wearing that shirt. Put him where he put him against Stefan in Greg's mind. And that's different now. And for Matt Turner to win the spot at Arsenal, it will mean that his distribution will have to be at a certain level and he will have to be playing at a certain level. And so that's his pathway sort of to becoming the starter uh, in this one. But I don't think Zach Steffens closed the door, as Doyle said, uh, with this window where he had all the opportunity, where when Turner was the starter, when Steffen was out, Turner was phenomenal in all the games he played. Other than the Canada one. 5-1 and a clean sheet at Azteca. So I think it, I, it, he, dropped a, he dropped a couple balls. Um, still some room to kind of work he, out some kinks, good. but he was good at the. Aztec. It's going to be tough to try. If he was, Aztec. yeah, if he was already the presumed number one, uh, I'm not sure anything has changed. Can all I right. throw a late shout out here after all of we did to? There's a play where Raul Jimenez looks like he's going to have an open header at the far post, and Diadra Yedlin comes through and challenges him. And it, I, in watching the game back, I noticed it. And it was an awesome play, and it's why Yedlin's in the team, and it was a really good moment. So shout out to DeAndre Yedlin, the first homegrown in World Cup history. 
Did I think that that was going to be how we ended this conversation? Oh, I, be perfectly honest. I would not. You could have. I would never have <laughs> predicted that ever. Uh, Costa Rica. I'm about to get US, down and do the worm. Nine oh. Oh, hey. You know what? Look. By the way, that terrible worm. Amazing reason for doing the worm from Christian Pulisic. If you haven't seen the story out there, uh, the team met with uh, Mason, who's a cancer fighter right now. He requested Christian Pulisic do the worm. Christian Pulisic did not practice doing the worm. <laughs> I, I I don't know that for that sure. That's my guess. That was an over before so, but he probably should have hit that on like whatever you know, you the hotel injured. carpet. Nah, that's a too, too risk of injury. The worm is a well, back, lucky, dangerous. Back spasms. Yeah, yeah. yeah you got to make those hip flexors. You got to. You, you got did a, lot a of very safe worm. There. I appreciate mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Uh, look, so the final games of World Cup qualifying in CONCACAF, match day 14 of Octagonal, going down on Wednesday. We're doing a, a full watch-along show for this. Sasha Kleshin will be with us. These watch-alongs have been a really fun time so far. So if you've been on those with us, awesome. Get in the comments section, ask us questions for stories, for takes, whatever it might be. Uh, 9.05 p.m. Eastern is the kick on that. I think we'll be live from 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Costa Rica hosting the U.S., uh, Panama hosting Canada, Mexico uh, hosting El Salvador, all to see who will get the top three spots. It looks, again, like you know, barring catastrophe, barring something insane, the U.S. will get it. Um, but the other thing going in their favor is that Costa Rica has got some yellow card issues. And we know now that those yellow cards, if they get another one, are suspended. They will be suspended for that single-game playoff in Qatar against, we assume, no disrespect to the Solomon Islands. Always been a big Solomon Island guy. Just say New, New Zealand. Zealand or Solomon Islands. It's yeah, quicker just, than this whole thing you just did. <laughs> well, it's, you know, sometimes it's not about quickness. Uh, who are the guys that we're looking at here? You see, Francisco Calvo could be suspended. Joel Campbell could be suspended. Cecil Borges could be suspended. Oviedo could be suspended. I think there's like five more sitting on a yellow card. So there's a lot of question marks about what Costa Rica will do, given the odds that they have. They're not in the realm of possibility, 6-0, 7-1, whatever it might be. Probably not going to happen. So if you're Costa Rica, you might save your horses for the game against New Zealand that you figure you're going to be big-time favorites in to win we'll see what happens in that match we'll see what happens to uh mexico with el salvador go hugo perez can i do pot Uh, talk for a second now yeah give me some give me some good pot talk okay so what we are talking about when we say pot talk is the pots for the world cup draw coming up on friday uh because yeah that's how quickly this whole thing happened Uh, by the way we have a watch long show for that as well demarcus beasley will be on so check that out uh we'll have i think some special guests who will play in the world cup from mls teams as well so that ought to be fun susanna collins will host doyle uh, you will be there as well, uh, along with Kalen and uh, Run DMB, Demarcus Beasley. So, okay, continue. So, Make sure you get off the pot. So, for the U.S., they are currently in pot two. They can, if they qualify automatically, can drop no further based off results. If they fall into fourth place, the fourth place team in CONCACAF will automatically be put into pot four because you won't have played that game yet, and all the playoff teams are in pot four. So, for the U.S., they need to win against Costa Rica to get into pot one. Pot one has seven teams that are already decided. Qatar and the top six teams in the world. No one can catch them. The last spot open is Portugal. If Portugal loses to North Macedonia, now that spot opens up. The U.S. would need to win. They would need the Netherlands to either tie or lose to Germany. And they would need Mexico to tie or lose to El Salvador. That's how the U.S. gets into pot one. Otherwise, you're sitting in pot two. Everyone who listens to this show is a North Macedonia fan right now. Because Canada also needs North Macedonia. Sorry, sorry, Thomas Formoso. I know that you're not actually... Up the mass. (laughs) Some of you out there. This is an Alexander the Great show, and it's always been one. Everyone knows that. So for Canada, they are currently in pot four. They need teams in front of them to to fall off for them to get into pot three, which would potentially take them out of group of death. The, the, it feels most likely that the Canada will be a part of that because they are so good for their standings. Um, what they need is basically five teams to drop off. They have now an additional team that will drop off because UEFA pushed their playoff later with Ukraine dealing with the war that they're in and the invasion. And so, therefore, that game got pushed. Those teams are automatically in pot four. Now, for Canada to get in, they basically need two other te- three other teams Sorry, to fall off. And you're looking at mainly African World Cup qualifying, the second legs of those five playoffs coming up. If Mexico or, or um, the U.S. drops down into the playoff, that would be one of the teams. If Portugal lost, that would be one of the teams. Most likely, you're looking at the teams from Africa. So who you're rooting for is Ghana, DR Congo, and Mali. All in, baby. Give me the love. 
Give me the love, Canada. Bring it on. We're all Ghana fans. Let's go DR Congo. Let's go Mali. All right. We will figure out the – we'll let Kaylin and Doyle figure out the math on that one. I was, uh, <laughs> was looking at that pot math, and I was like, ah, you know what? I think Susanna's got this one. I think she's just the, – the, the math side of this is not for me. We'll put somebody in there who's a little quicker on the uptake. Uh, so that'll be fun. The draw going down on the first on Friday and, of course, Wednesday night, a live show as well. Let's uh, real quick hit Canada and the performance and then some MLS games and get out of here. So that's the Sam Atacubi game. <laughs> it's so much space. that left. I, I feel terrible for Javane Brown. We're on with Toussaint Ricketts, who, of course, knows Javane well, teammates uh, in Vancouver, and the entire game for Canada – they are just stuffing the ball down the left side into open space after open space for Adekubi to run onto and play these just impossible to deal with balls across the top of the box. Uh, Dave, you and I watched it live. We've already sort of given our takes on it, I think, for those that were watching. Doyle, what was your sort of uh, your in-game performance take on Canada in this 4-0 win against Jamaica? That really, it could have been 6-7-8 yeah. maybe even. They missed a ton of guilt edge chances. They did, and they they missed a ton against Costa Rica the other day as well. Uh, I honestly, I, I feel like these were their be- their two best attacking performances of the Ocho because they they have been a little cagier. I, I think they they played a lot like the U.S. used to play, um, where they would absorb a lot of pressure and, and go forward on the break. And obviously, they still did that in, in both these games. Um, but a lot of it was more front foot being on the ball, uh, ripping teams apart with their movement in the final third and not just in transition. Um, and it's a, it's a testament to the talent. It's a testament to the coaching. It's a testament to the cohesion. They have had um, very good fortune to really not miss a lot of guys to the types of injuries that have made it tough on the U.S. Obviously, they're missing Alfonso Davies, but um, – uh, you know, Adekugbe has been there from day one. Uh, Tejan and, and Richie Larea have been there from day one. Uh, Jonathan David's been there from day one. Kyle Lahren did miss a couple of games, but he, every, every time he's been back, it's been like slotting. It's the, the easiest thing to slot him back into the lineup. But that level of cohesion, they really brought it to bear um, with a vengeance against Jamaica because I think they were frustrated with themselves after playing so well at Costa Rica and not getting anything out of it. Um, and it was part Canada imposing themselves through their superior talent and part just like, okay, when Jamaica's screwing up, when Javane Brown's keeping everybody on side, take advantage of that. Don't, don't let a good mistake go to waste. And it sounds easy. And when you have two Champions League strikers – in Jonathan David and Kyle Lahren, it occasionally looks easy. And they made it look really, really easy uh, in this one. It, it, like, just so good. So good. And uh, they deserve, like, they've been the best team in, in the Ocho, and they deserve it. They deserve to, to qualify in front of their fans with a stadium filled like that, with a performance like that. Um, and, like, I can't wait to see them annihilate somebody who's underestimating them <laughs> in november like please let them be drawn that's the almost england. thing like i, I please even, you know, put them in a group with england i'm dying for it <laughs> <laughs> well goss was talking about the pots like if they ended up somehow in this group of death um I they will make the group of death like that's yeah. Yeah. that's where they're at right now like the group they yeah. get pu- pushed into. unless they get qatar right yeah, as the okay. number one pot there it's almost it feels like it's guaranteed right now nah. Well, I don't know. There, is there a team that's like has the personality for that? I think it's this team, right? Like they yeah. they seem like the type that just gone straight to the U.S. and Mexico and been like, all right, we're gonna, you know, to steal a Will Smith, we're gonna slap you in the face and like <laughs> just <laughs> take. take just, it took us an hour and fifteen yeah, minutes to get one. Yeah. Someone had to do it. Uh, <laughs> the other thing I think about for these guys is like. I still, I'm still interested to see, I think of it from the player's perspective and like, you know, these guys getting their opportunity, but I I also think of what it might do for them. uh, I mean, beyond the experience, which is, you know, a lifelong dream, but as far as in the transfer market, uh, because some of these guys are still like, you think have a lot more to go as far as like bigger clubs going after and maybe are just still a little bit under the radar. Um, 
maybe because of the perception of Canada or the lack of perception of where it is. Um, so when you look at like Jonathan David, like where, you know, he's already been linked with some big clubs, uh, bigger clubs, I would say, than Lille and, you know, Tejan just got over to Europe not long ago at Bruges. Like, where is he going to be? You just think of like these guys that could find a moment, and then the MLS guys, whether it's Alistair or Mark Anthony Kay or others, like you just look at what they, if you have a moment in the biggest of stages, of the biggest of stages, like what that can do um, for them. And then also, I think, you know, even looking future to like future young players coming out of Canada. Um, it's going to be incredible. So um, big shout out to them. And I, I just can't help but think it also of the, from like the individual perspective of what it might do for uh, the perception of Canadian players and, you know, also the transfer market, frankly. Kaylin's Kay- counting Montreal's money right now. Because Montreal's <laughs> already there. They put out for Alistair Johnson. They saw this coming. They've got Ismail Kone in the team. They, did, they got Kamal they are, Miller from before that. They are counting the money that doesn't exist yet. They Watch <laughs> out. They are uh, pumped for this World Cup. No analysis. This is from FCP92. Uh, reasonable expectations for Canada at the World Cup. What's reasonable? I think it would, the, I, I think to get out of the group stage, right, for them to be able to manage three games because Doyle mentioned how good they can set up. But in a World Cup, you don't know who you get matched up against. You also have Ustakio in this team. You also have a team that if they have to, can dominate the ball, press high, and create chances as well. And so I think they're a perfect tournament team because they can change the way they play and they have depth. After the round of six, or, you know, once you get to the round 16 on, then you're starting to talk about historic stuff that just doesn't normally fall for teams that aren't named Italy, Germany, and Argentina. Um, But I think it's reasonable, depending how the draw looks, and even without the draw, to say this is a team that can get out of the group. I Italy wish they were Canada. (laughs) Uh, uh, all right here we go uh that's it for us on the world cup qualification side we'll have more of course coming on uh we'll have it wednesday night i think uh, ahead of the draw we'll do a reaction late wednesday night after the the uh, final round of Concacaf games when we um knock on wood uh, we'll bring out the banner again for the u.s that says qualified you know they said they had that that banner unfortunately in orlando and christian pulisic said afterwards we didn't even know what that thing said somebody just handed it to us we got to find out who handed them that banner that's messed up. They're going to Qatar. We don't know how just yet. Uh, real quick before we get out of here. MLS it was, by the way, Sebastian well. Blanco and Diego Valeri. They were like, you're already qualified. And then Zarek came out and he was like, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, Zarek the way qualifying like, works. <laughs> Technically, the math here, yeah. guys. I know you don't understand. Goal differential, all these other things. Uh, see, we have a lot of Charlotte fans who uh, – this is a, a sort of a summation of what they wanted us to say here. Uh, Jonathan Scott, I would love a reevaluation of Charlotte and their place within the league. This is after a 2-0 win at home against Cincinnati with the Carol Swiderski brace for the second game in a row. Uh, Keenan Condor, Charlotte rising, period. Miguel Angel Ramirez looking like a good to great MLS coach. Swiderski, golden boot challenger, and Charlotte a playoff bubble team. Blue Crown <laughs> Soccer says, honestly asking, where does Kalina stand in the best goalkeepers of all time in MLS? Actually, he said in the league right now, but I just added the all, of all time in MLS. That's <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you're adding a lot yeah. of uh, narrative. <laughs> that's Yeah, that's the this. vibe I'm getting right now. Uh, ben Bender looks really, really good. Looks like a great number one overall draft pick. Charlotte have back-to-back wins. Swiderski's banging them. Doyle, what's your reevaluation of Charlotte and their place within the league? Six points, not in the playoff field yet in the East. But, uh, yeah, this a fun win for them. Yeah, uh, fun win. They, they have... It, you know, Bender looks great. Swider- I love Swiderski. Um, Kalina has looked great. It's worth remembering this time last year, Jonathan Bond and Brad Stuver were the front runners for goalkeeper of the year. So, like, things can change. I, I did go look up the underlying numbers. He's, like, m- top of the middle of the pack and basically uh, goals prevented in comparison to the XG yeah, that he has. Some models have him preventing about a goal. That should have been scored. Other models have him allowing a goal that should have been scored. But he was very good. In, he was good in this game. Cincinnati he, had more he XG. Was, yeah. and he was really he was good very in this good. game. And but that's like that's the thing. Like Charlotte, were pretty good. Um, they 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 had their big moments and they capitalized on them in a way that uh, Cincy wasn't able to. Um, I've, nothing I've seen so far has led me to. Uh, really reassess my original take, which was that like this team is going to end up somewhere in the Austin to Minnesota realm of expansion clubs, you know, 30 to 36, 37 points. Um, you know, maybe if things go right, they get a couple of killer DPs in the next window and go on a run the second half. Maybe they could push up towards 50. Um, but I, 
I don't quite see that from this group as of yet. But like they're they're not a disaster. I don't think anybody other than Miguel Angel Ramirez for a second really thought this was going to be a Cincinnati level car crash of a of a team. Um, so it, it's good. The other thing that's worth noting. Uh, you know, since that we're screwed uh, press conference six weeks ago, they have mostly gone out and guys, gone out and got guys from within the league, and those guys have been plugged right into the starting lineup. In this instance, it was Derek Jones doing a job as uh, a defensive midfielder. So while the focus was on, oh man, they the DPS are falling through. What has actually been the case is they have gone out and like actively added guys who have MLS experience. And I think that's pretty clearly helped um, through five games now. I mean, just look at the partnership that Swiderski and Daniel Rios have up top already. Swiderski also wasn't there when he said that comment yet. So he was not within the within the group, too. So if you're just looking down the line, you're like, I, I could see if you it looks a little that guy, take you, Swiderski yeah. out of the last couple of results. He might have been be right. Different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, all right, well, can we also then state when David said they'd take two points out of the first two games or whatever? Oh, I said, no, 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 was also no, not there. No, 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 I didn't know he wasn't going to DC. Wow. Did, did you go third here. person on that one when David said? Yeah, yeah I wow. think I did. <laughs> wow. I think you I did. Like, I'm you holistic like one, you now. Like one medium. of those a, a decade. You just used I'm, your third. I'm going to reference. Costa Rica. I'm a holistic guy now. That person was a different person. Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. You're you're big in the natural, huh? Only only the only the best. No bottom feeders for David Goss. We already know that. Sporting Kansas City, one nothing uh, over El Salt Lake. Johnny Russell with the goal late on in this one. A home win for Kansas City. We won't talk too much about that one. That'll be it. Uh, Portland Timbers one one against Orlando City. Uh, Portland get a late goal in this one. Sebastian Blanco a sub yet again. Uh, Junior Urso, a favorite of David Goss uh, from from way back, uh, gets the goal for Orlando. He's got his goal scoring form going right now. MLS Next Pro kicked off this weekend. A big goal for Juan Cousin uh, for St. Louis City, too. They got a win at home in the first game of that new league. We have a podcast out on the channel here, the last one that came out, with uh, Charles Alchek, the president of MLS Next Pro, and Ali Curtis, who's heading up the sporting side. So if you want to know more about that league, go listen to that one. You can watch all the games at MLS Next Pro. Dot com. Some big goals scored, some good goals scored this weekend. That'll be uh, the next sort of uh, the next frontier for player development for MLS that just got off the ground. And we'll end it here. Giorgio Cellini wants to come to MLS reportedly for a year. After no, Weeby. That's your transition. <laughs> you could have transitioned from what you just said to an unreal mailbag question we have about selling players. But okay, instead well, you transition to an MLS retirement league question. I do it, man. That, we have a question here from Sam Miller who says, I was having a conversation about MLS being a selling league. My friend asked me who's been sold out of MLS that he would know. This made me think of my question. What's the best 11 of active players who have so been sold from MLS, either de developed in an MLS academy or MLS had a role in them getting better? For example, both Miguel Elmiron and Jack Harrison would be eligible, but Zlatan would not be based off his thing. He then goes on Weeby. He gives you an opening. He says, feel free to make five best 11s if that's yeah. what strikes. Sam, you know us too well. <laughs> uh, what, who, who's the goalkeeper then? Probably Tim Howard? Just or Brad on, Guzan. Yeah, yeah or Bra I would say Tim Howard wins that one. So well, just as, in the interest of doing 1-11. Yeah, this all, is all time. time. Well, no, no, it was active. It says active. Oh, active. So Howard's not eligible. Okay, so okay, so maybe it would be Stefan or guys who have, Are we talking about guys who have come – through academies or have to have played in MLS? I think it can be just it they literally had, they had says, formative, any sort of formative moment within MLS. He, he literally gives Miguel Almiron and Jack Harrison as two examples that you're allowed to use. Okay. So Tyler Adams is obviously in this team. Yeah. Boom. Uh, uh, did they have to be signed to the first team? Because you could bring Weston McKinney in as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, those, would, those would count. Those and players Reyna. would count. Yeah. And Reyna. So Reyna... Reyna, Adams, McKinney. We may not be building 11 here. We might just be giving a lot of good names. You could put Chris Richards uh, in Aronson. there. Aronson. Aronson. Chris Richards is a good one. Uh, good shout in that Would sense. you put Tim Ream in there? Eric Palmer Brown. Eric Palmer, Palmer Brown, Brown. Tim Ream. Uh, George Bellow. Joe Scally. Oh, well, Alfonso Reynolds, Davies would obviously Reggie be your, Cannon, your left Alfonso back here. Davies. Like, it's too much. Yeah. It's too much. You can't well, just maybe we'll put one out in this. <laughs> you got, you got to be able to make an 11. Ambrose Ayango? possibility he's nice. at left back 
<laughs> nice. How about nobody wants to nobody wants to wait in on Georgie uh, Kalini? Maybe he gets recruited to Inter Miami. You know, they they could use another. What about Montreal? Ooh. Or Toronto. And start over who? Joel Joel Waterman? Gabriel Corbo? Rudy Camacho? <laughs> Sorry. Are you oh, watching so the games, Kalen? I would have got, would have got you <laughs> I know we're out of here. We will see you late on Wednesday night. Uh, hang out with us on the watch. Oh, sorry. With DeMarcus My apologies Beasley. to Ashley Lawrence and all of Brampton. I would like to. Yes. It <laughs> so, wouldn't be yeah. allowed back in if you did not get that <laughs> exactly. apology. And door would be, the door would be shut to one Kalen's Kale, Kale. brand is in shambles. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I had a late night last night coming back from. I'm, I'm surprised they didn't tack on a movement promotion at the very end of that. Like a big well, apology. You just if you want the full story, you can catch up. <laughs> got the movement on YouTube. All right, we'll see you on Wednesday night, everybody. Tag along with us for the watch along for the final round of World Cup qualifying in CONCACAF. We will record a podcast right after and release it to you so your Thursday morning will have some listening material. We're out of here. Adios. <laughs>